Oakland Historical Society. Uh, my name is Bo Mendez. I work in uh, programs and communications here, so it's my honor and privilege to welcome you all here tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to be having a very interesting discussion about the history of sugar. It's something that we use every day, and maybe we could stand to use a little bit less. Um, but before we get into that, I'd like to see, by show of hands, who's here for the very first time? That's all right, that's a good bit. Uh, so first time, of course, does not mean the last time. Uh, welcome to all of our new friends, and welcome back to all of our old friends and seasoned vets. Um, for those of y'all who are joining us for the first time here, and if in, in case anybody needs a refresher, I'd just like to share a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, luckily, it was made very easy by the founders of this institution and the uh, namers of this institution. It's all right there in the name, Brooklyn Historical Society. We are a society that talks about the history of Brooklyn, and that's, that's it. You can all go home. Um, but much like the topic of tonight's uh, presentation of uh, sugar, Brooklyn seems kind of simple on the outside. And once you look in and look closer, you'll find that it's very uh, crystalline and beautiful and complex. So what we do here at Brooklyn Historical Society is we research things that have happened here in Brooklyn, uh, whether you're thinking about the 400 years or so since European settling, or you're talking about even long before then, uh, during uh, when the Native Americans were living here, uh, also even when the glaciers that carved this part of the world out. Uh, we talk about that entire stream of history and connect how things that happened here in Brooklyn had um, consequences, connections, ripples that were felt elsewhere in the country and sometimes even the entire world. A good example of that could be found in our exhibitions. Uh, we're actually kind of presenting tonight's event in conjunction with our exhibition, Waterfront, uh, which is one of our newer exhibitions and is available at our uh, second location down in Dumbo. And in that exhibition, we talk about the history of the waterfront from its formation, its uh, geological and ecological formation, all the way through um, the settling of the city, through the industrial kind of boom that spurred a lot of the growth in Brooklyn, what happened after industry left, and even some of the questions that we're answering today about um, the future of climates and our rising waters that we're dealing with on the Brooklyn waterfront. Um, so we conduct the research that goes into exhibitions like those. We also allow, um, not even allow, we provide and we serve communities that are looking to do their own research via our library upstairs, which uh, I like to say it has anything you'd ever want to know about Brooklyn and probably a few things that you don't want to know about Brooklyn. Um, they're all in the library. Um, and we do programs like the one that you're here for tonight. Um, like I was saying, Things that happen in Brooklyn tend to connect to other things, even things that not, you might not necessarily think are related to this borough in particular. But this borough is kind of a nexus for things that are happening uh, around a lot of things that go on in the world. So our programs like to reflect that. Uh, we talk about politics, we talk about current events, we'll talk about pop culture, pretty much anything that you'd want to be interested in. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to share a few more that are coming up. Um, relating to Waterfront, the, ex the exhibition, and um, the history of Brooklyn, as a, a global location. Tomorrow we'll be hosting another book talk um, right here in this space for the book Brooklyn Tides, The Fall and Rise of a Global Borough, which will look at how the tides of time, literally, have changed Brooklyn's perception worldwide. Um, what happened during the post-industrial years and the economic crises, and how Brooklyn has come to be synonymous with cool and rejuvenated and hip worldwide. Uh, so that'll be tomorrow. Um, Later on this month, we're actually going to be hosting a Halloween party. You may have noticed that uh, there's a little bit of that fall Christmas out in the air, and whenever that happens, I like to think that things are getting a little creepy, and things are getting a little, you know, scary sometimes. So we're going to be hosting uh, a celebration of all things Halloween um, on October 31st. We'll have uh, Andrea Janes, who's the founder of Burrows of the Dead, will be giving um, a lecture about ghost stories here in Brooklyn. We'll be hosting Amy Cunningham, who's a funeral director, to talk about the history of burial shrouds um, and all sorts of other ghoulish delights. And speaking of scary things, uh, on November 5th, we'll be talking about elections in the age of Trump um, by welcoming uh, John Sides, who's a professor, professor of political science and the author of a book called Identity Crisis, which looks at the 2016 election and its repercussions. He'll be in conversation with Claire Malone from 538, and they'll be talking about how what happened in 2016 is continuing to reverberate today and how that shapes our electoral uh, process. Uh, and on November 7th, we'll be uh, 
doing a deep dive into our collection. Some of our programs are very big ideas and very global things, and sometimes we like to bring it right back here to Brooklyn and to our neighborhoods and communities. So we'll be doing something called Tales from the Vault, which is where we look uh, deep into our collection and uh, kind of curate an experience um, about how you can research documents and see um, how things have unfolded. This particular iteration will um, explore an organization called Brooklyn for Peace, which is uh, more than three decades they've been involved in political causes, both local, national, and international, and we'll be seeing uh, what their collection, which we just acquired and digitized and cataloged, what we can learn from that collection. Um, that's just a few things. We're also gonna be talking about the history of uh, cider here in Brooklyn. We'll be talking about Guyanese writers. We'll be looking at uh, the current state of the HIV and AIDS conversation here in New York City. Uh, these are all things that are happening in our season um, of programs, and you can learn more about it by picking up one of our pretty blue calendars, uh, which are available at the front desk. Um, you can keep, keep in touch with us on social media, sign up for our e-newsletter, and that all boils down to don't be a stranger. If this is your first time here, don't make it your last, uh, and if you've been coming, keep on coming. Um, and now, that's probably enough out of me. Uh, we are going to be shifting to the topic of tonight's discussion, which is uh, kind of circling around the book Sugar, The World Corrupted from uh, Slavery to Obesity, which is actually available in our gift shop. Uh, so if you'd like to know more about tonight's talk, you can take that home with you. And uh, in order to get into the talk, we brought someone far more qualified than I am. And would you look at that? He's been here the whole time. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor James Walvin who is the author of many books on slavery and modern social history. His book, Crossings, was published by Reaction Books in 2013. Uh, his first book with Michael Creighton was a detailed study of a sugar plantation, a Jamaican plantation worthy park from 1670 to 1970. He became a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 2006, and in 2008 was awarded an Order of the British Empire for services to scholarship. Please welcome James Walton. Bo, thank you very much indeed. Um, my height is a bit of a problem with microphones. Um, shout if you can't hear me at the back. Uh, thank you very much for the generous introduction and thank you all for coming. Um, I, I love coming to New York. Um, I've been visiting New York City um, every year, bar one, since 1964. And my first night was Labor, night, uh, Labor Day, 1964. And I was staying with people I didn't know, and they made me welcome. Uh, Lexington East 28th Street, uh, Al and Esther Cohen. And as I went to bed in their small apartment, Al Cohen came in, opened the drawer, and took out a Union Jack on which he had sewn tea bags. Union Jack with tea bags rampant. And I went to sleep my first night in the United States under a Union Jack. I mean, <laughs> how could you not like, you know, coming back every year after that? Well, thanks again for coming. Um, let me begin by making a few stark assertions. Um, I've been working on slavery and related issues for most of my academic life. Um, and I've circled around the question of sugar. Sugar is, has remained central in ways that I didn't always recognize. Um, but sugar kept coming in and out of the work that I did. And I think it'll become clear why that, it, why that happened. But let me begin with some pretty stark um, assertions, and then I'll try to spend 40 minutes or so um, explaining or illuminating them. Um, sugar has been at the heart, really, of some of the darkest aspects of um, modern history, let's say since about 1600, um, and has been central to those dark episodes of, of history in ways that really the West has not fully come to recognize. I'm not merely talking about the, the health issues that sugar, uh, uh, sugar has created, um, but much more broadly based problems. The impact of sugar on the health of millions of people um, has been disastrous. And again, not just now as a matter of a global epidemic, but over a very long period, which I'll try to illustrate. And the cultivation of sugar, of cane sugar, the cultivation of cane sugar has caused enormous damage, enormous environmental damage in great swathes of the globe. There are whole 
areas of the globe that were transformed utterly by the, the West's desire for sugar and the emergence of cane sugar production in the tropics. Um, it wiped out the, effectively wiped out the um, rainforests of the Caribbean, um, Cuba, Jamaica, and other places, to make land cultivable for sugar. It had had disastrous effects on environment. And that's been true, of course, right down to the, the last 40 years in the, in the Florida Ever Everglades. We know what disastrous effect cult cultivating sugar has had in that region. Uh, but of course, the most obvious way in which sugar has had some uh, extraordinary uh, upheavals has been in population. The coming of sugar on the back of the European settlements destroyed the Taino people of the Caribbean. We think there were about, well, we know there were about a million people, native peoples, living in the Caribbean islands uh, on the eve of um, the Columbus um, settlement in the Americas. Um, a million people who were effectively wiped out within a very short space of time. Um, wiped out sometimes deliberately, but mainly because of the impact of disease. Um, but of course, the other thing that followed that was the extraordinary, and this, will, this is the central core of what I'm going to talk about, the extraordinary transformation of um, the, the tropical Americas by the importation of Africans. You cannot think about sugar without thinking about slavery. And you cannot think about uh, slavery without understanding the kind of creation of extraordinary new populations in the Americas that, uh, on a scale that we'd not really seen before in, in human history. And not, that movement of populations didn't merely end with the ending of slavery, well, the ending of the slave trade, uh, because there was an extraordinary movement of populations after the ending of slavery, the huge numbers of, of Indian indentured labor that was shipped by the British and by other Europeans, but by the British uh, primarily, uh, to their former slave colonies. So huge numbers of Indians that went from uh, the subcontinent to Trinidad to throughout the Caribbean, but also, of course, to... Um, to East Africa, to South Africa, to Natal, uh, to Fiji. Uh, think of the Japanese who were moved as indentured labor into Hawaii, into the sugar plantations of Hawaii in the late 19th century. Sugar has been at the heart of these quite extraordinary human movements over a very long period of time. But let's um, begin with a here and now. Uh, this, this is familiar to um, many people, many local people. This, of course, is the, um, uh, the, the Domino Sugar Refinery uh, on the Walter side in Brooklyn, now apartments. Um, uh, the American Sugar Company Corporation becomes a trust, along with all the great other uh, American industries in the, the late 18th century. Sugar is a trust. It's an enormous industry. And in fact, you can see its enormity by looking at the, the dockside architecture up and down the east coast of the United States, the old refineries um, that were um, uh, catering to the quite extraordinary American demand for uh, sugar consumption in the late 19th century. Um, this one is, I think this one is from Baltimore. Again, the, 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 the refineries and warehouses converted to um, modern living apartments, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in fact, the refineries transform the face of docksides, not merely in uh, what becomes the United States, but clean across Europe. What's very peculiar about this is that you have these huge buildings that are constructed along the docksides of North America and then in Europe uh, for a product that actually is grown in the, in the tropical Americas. Uh, in Antwerp, there are ref sugar refineries uh, in 1855, there were about 19 of them. In Amsterdam, there are 40 of them in 1650. In London, by the 1750s, there are about 80 sugar refineries in London. Uh, in New York, in 1789, there's only one. By uh, 17, 1789, there are seven, uh, seven American cities with sugar refineries all on the key waterfront. And the interesting thing about that is that it's cane sugar that's being imported primarily from the Caribbean, and refined into a commodity which is then shipped all around the Western world. So you've got an extraordinary network of commercial transaction taking place around this one single commodity, long before the emergence of modern industries. But how do we get from that um, to this? I mean, there's a big leap between the history of sugar and what's happened in the Western world today. I mean, I could, you know, we're all familiar with the cartoons of modern living and what sugar does to us. 
And the United States, of course, is full of problems about obesity and the related uh, problems of ill health and obesity. And this is just one of the caricatures. Um, how do we get to this? I mean, this is a pretty terrible picture. Um, now, before you think that this is yet another story of a Brit coming, um, being, giving the Americans a hard time, um, let me reinforce it. This is Yankee Stadium, of course. 2.5 million, billion, I should say, that cost to build the new Yankee Stadium. The curious thing about it, you may think, what's this got to do with sugar? Well, actually, there are 4,000 fewer seats in the new Yankee Stadium than there were in the old Yankee Stadium, built in 1923. And there are fewer seats because... Americans have got bigger. And again, this is not me trying to take it, make a dig at the Americans, because look at these. These, in some ways, these are the really most shocking pictures. These are pictures of, of uh, English children. This one and this one. Um, I think of all the pictures I've looked at from when I'm trying to think about um, uh, the history of sugar. These two are the most shocking. But, uh, they, they illustrate a really serious problem um, in English. It's English and Welsh. The Scottish have their own statistics. But the statistics of dental decay amongst children in England and Wales today is really quite extraordinary. Uh, one child, they think that one fifth of all children uh, have dental problems in England and Wales. Uh, one in seven of them, aged between 5 and 15, have severe dental uh, decay. Um, and in the years between 2011 and 2014, 26,000 children uh, under the age of nine in England and Wales had to be admitted to hospital for extraction of teeth under total anaesthetic. Now, these are, this is a modern, Western, rich society that has this kind of dental problem that you think of more, um, you might actually imagine this is something to do with a kind of third world country, but it isn't. This is a modern, industrial, wealthy city, uh, country. And of course, what lies behind that is not merely kind of personal problems about dental hygiene, but the consumption of sugar, of children's consumption of sugar on a quite extraordinary scale, particularly in their soft drinks, fizzy drinks, and breakfast cereals. There's been a, there's a, a study every 10 years from 1973 onwards of the dental health amongst uh, English and Welsh children and the, the problems of getting worse decade by decade. It really is a, a, really, a shocking state of affairs. Now, that English problem of dental... And, of course, Americans have got this thing about the British and their teeth, don't they? I mean, every, every time it comes up, you say, oh, well, you Brits, you know, what you, um, look at our teeth, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm then shown the kind of uh, piano keys that Americans have as teeth, and they look at our English. Well, this is not just a modern problem of uh, uh, sugar decay. This, this is a comment. I hope everyone can read this. This is a comment of the French ambassador speaking about Queen Elizabeth I in 1597. Let me just read it. For the, I assume everyone can read it. As for her face, it is and appears to be very aged. It is long and thin, and her teeth are very yellow and unequal compared to what they formerly were, so they say. And on the left side, less than on the right. Many of them are missing, so that one cannot understand her easily when she speaks quickly. That's Queen Elizabeth I, 1597, in the eyes of the French ambassador. Now, the interesting thing about that, of course, Queen Elizabeth loved her sugar. She loved lashings of sugar in her drinks. Uh, it, it wasn't just uh, an English phenomenon. This is the Sun King, a century later. This is um, Louis XIV, the great king of France. This is a portrait by Rigaud, which hangs in the, um, uh, the Getty in California. There are different versions of it, but the original is in the Getty in California. Now, what I'd like to do is look at this picture very carefully. Uh, here is a, a tall man, a man full of kind of regal pomp and splendor, uh, a military man, the sword, wonderful head of hair. In fact, he's five foot four. Well, nothing wrong with me five foot four, by the way. Um, uh, he, it's the only thing he and I have got in common. Um, uh, he's as bald as a badger. He has no hair whatsoever, and he has no teeth. He doesn't smile. Now, French portraiture from, of, of aristocrats and royals from 
uh, throughout the late 17th into the 18th century, uh, very rarely show, show them smiling. There is a culture of not smiling. S smiling is thought to be vulgar. It's thought to be plebeian. It's showing emotions that shouldn't be revealed. But it also is a reflection of the fact that French aristocrats and royals had very, very bad teeth. And they had very bad teeth because they had become extraordinary consumers of cane sugar. They consumed sugar with their coffee, sometimes with their tea, with their coffee and with their chocolate, on a quite extraordinary scale. Um, there's a wonderful book by a man called Colin Jones called The Smile Revolution, which is a study of French aristocratic portraiture. And he, he hones in on this question of the fact that he has no teeth. If you read the dental treatment that the king received, it's actually, you need an anesthetic to read it. It's so horrible. Uh, what, he had no teeth. Um, and he loved his sugar. It was often said that he could stand a spoon up in his coffee and it would stand up because there was so much sugar in there. You may think this, well, this, this obviously has something to do with sugar. This is a, a, a wonderful porcelain sugar bowl of the 1760s. I think this one is in the, the Victoria Albert Museum in London. Uh, this is uh, produced at the Royal Factory. And that was uh, very close to Madame Pompadour's um, palace. And it, once the Europeans cracked the ability to make porcelain, they begin to produce these wonderful uh, coffee and tea sets, at the heart of which was the sugar bowl. Now, who, looking at that today, and, and if you read the catalogues of porcelain tea sets and coffee sets and, and sugar bowls, you will very rarely see the major point of this, and that is that this is a sugar bowl that is filled with cane sugar that is produced by slaves. That takes you straight to the heart of slavery in the Caribbean. When that was made in the French, French aristocratic life, the French are pouring Africans into the French islands, but particularly into Saint-Domingue, what becomes Haiti in 17, um, 1801 when it becomes Haiti. The Africans are pouring in in unprecedented numbers at its peak. Haiti receives 80,000 African uh, slaves a year, huge numbers. By the, by the eve of the French Revolution, Saint-Domingue, Haiti, had knocked Jamaica off the graph as a producer of sugar and of coffee. And it was all because of Africans. But again, who makes the association between royalty having no teeth, porcelain being produced in these extraordinarily beautiful items, and the slaves who make the whole thing possible? The link between the two is actually very rarely made. It's, it's, it's almost as if you're talking about beauty and the beast. I'll return to that theme uh, later. At first, the cane sugar that was produced from uh, the, the first of all the Atlantic islands, then the Caribbean and Brazil, uh, is, it's, it's costly. It's, and it takes the form of, in, in the Western world, of these extraordinary sugar sculptures to, to display the kind of power and uh, status and wealth of European elites. People, they have pastry chefs uh, specializing in creating these quite extraordinary sugar uh, sculptures, subtleties as they were called. And these would be designed specifically for a particular monarch or a particular aristocrat. Uh, but they were for um, elites of society, not for ordinary people. Here's another one. These, these of course, are recent concoctions. But nonetheless, those, we have an ample examples of this usage of sugar uh, of elites when it's still very pricey and costly and not available to ordinary people and becomes used as a, as a means of expressing a person's status, wealth and, um, and power. This is the beast that lies behind the whole problem. Um, this is the main issue. This is sugar cane. And those, many of you in the audience will know it. Um, it grows to 12 feet high. Um, it's throughout the Caribbean and Brazil is the, the center of this whole story. And this is the, where I entered the story. This is where I started to work in 1967 as a researcher at Worthy Park Estates. It's slap in the middle of Jamaica. Um, we're looking due west at this point from the mountains that drop over from the other side across the, the cane fields. Now, this is a, a sugar plantation that's been in operation as a sugar plantation between 1670 right through to the present day. Uh, that there, are, there are others that have had this unbroken history, but this is also the best recorded. We were very, very lucky to find the, the, the documents that were all, no one knew where they were. They were actually in the, the, uh, the ceiling of the, um, 
uh, the clerk's offices, and they were, they were found out, and we wrote the history around those documents. Now, the, 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 here is a place that is extraordinarily beautiful. It's an extraordinary, uh, beautiful, uh, tropical setting. But it is, of course, a place where some terrible things happened. This, again, is another shot of Worthy Park Estate in, in the middle of Jamaica, looking, uh, looking due west across the, the valley of, with all of this is sugar, uh, until you reach the, 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 mount, the hills, the mountain on the other side, which is the beginning of the cockpit country on the other side of Jamaica. And here, in the middle of all this, is the factory. So one of the interesting things about the growth of slavery and sugar production in the Caribbean is that it, we think of this as something that is pre-industrial, but right at the heart of it is an industrial enterprise. The sugar cane is cut down and processed into sugar, uh, crude sugar, which is then shipped to North America and to Europe for processing into finer sugar. There's a discipline and a, a work discipline that's created on the sugar plantations amongst the African slaves that students of industrialization have not really come to terms with, that the slaves are amongst the first people in the Western world to be subjected to that extraordinary discipline of industrial work, that we think of it in, uh, in, in the mills of Lowell in Massachusetts or of Lancashire in England, but it actually it takes place in, amongst the Africans in the Caribbean and in Brazil at a much earlier phase. Now here, this is not Worthy Park, but it, it could just as well be. These are pictures from Antigua in the 1830s by a man called Clark. He did a series of sketches. And what's interesting is this is a group of slaves working, cutting down in the harvest the sugar cane. Just look at this for a second. Look in some detail at it. The cane cutters are mixed. We used to think that it was the, uh, the work of mainly of men. It's, in fact, if you look at this picture, but half of them are women. And then if you look at the what people gathering up the sugar cane behind them, they've got older people and children working. You have the white men uh, in control. But look at what the, uh, the workers are using. The slaves are all using machetes, machetes, and other uh, agricultural implements. On most plantations, the slaves outnumber the white elite by 10 to 1, 12 to 1. And that raises a very interesting question about how does a small band of white people keep huge numbers of Africans in control over such a long period of time? It raises all interesting questions about how it works. How does slavery work to produce this commodity? And this is to produce a commodity that the Western world had not had before in any volume and which they have done very well without for centuries, and yet which they come to think of as absolutely necessary. So you've got Africans shipped into the Americas to produce a commodity that itself had been imported and, that the, and actually had tremendously damaging effects on the environment and on the Western diet and health. Here, a picture from the same series. This is a factory. Again, very much like the one I showed you from Worthy Park, except this is an 18th century picture. And you, you see, that this is an industrial process at work in the middle of a kind of rural uh, environment. The white men, the elite, and the slaves um, working the factory. These are people who develop skills. The Africans are given certain skills to uh, turn the sugar cane into refined sugar. Um, this is pretty obvious. But I'd, what I'd like you to think about is the kind of flow of people. This is the movement of Africans into the Americas to make this possible. What we're looking at here is the, the largest enforced movement of peoples in pre-recorded history. We have no example of these numbers being moved on this scale. We know because of the men who did this atlas, a team around them, a man called Eltis and Richardson, we know that something like 12 million Africans are loaded onto the Atlantic slave ships. And we know that about 11 million, give or take you know, a few hundred thousand either way, we know that about 11 million survive to landfall. This is a quite extraordinary movement of people. And of course, that at a time when the world's population is much, much lower than it is today. So these are huge numbers of people. But look at the flow of where the Africans are going to. This is what I really want you to think about. This large flow, the large central flow of people from Africa are going to Brazil or the Caribbean. There's only a very smaller, 
a much smaller number and percentage that actually go into North America. The smallest proportion of all Africans landed in the Americas actually land in North America. And it's one of the things that when you're teaching in North America, uh, North American kids find very hard to grasp, particularly African American kids, that actually there are huge numbers, many more Africans shipped to the Caribbean and Brazil than are to North America. And why is that? Well, it's for sugar. The engine behind this is sugar. It's, it's not an accident that millions of people go to Brazil and the Caribbean because that is where sugar is produced. It's not just sugar, of course. They're producing other things, and slaves eventually go into work every conceivable occupation that you can think of, from nurses to seamen, uh, seamstresses, cooks, the whole range. But sugar is the great engine that lures boatloads of Africans year after year into the Americas. The other things that you might look at on this graph, is this, this map rather, is the movement of Africans elsewhere out of Central Africa um, as slaves. Uh, the most obvious one across the, north, uh, across the Sahara to the North Africa. East Africa into Arabia and onto India. There is an extraordinary movement of Africans out of the continent over a very long period of time, not merely across the Atlantic, but across the Indian Ocean. This is a movement of peoples that, when we add all these things together, um, gives you some sense of what is happening to Africa. The African population is, being, is hemorrhaging away east, west, and north over a very long period of time. Here's, again, some kind of statistical analysis of, the, uh, of that map, in a way. And this, I hope everyone can see this. Is it clear enough at the back? Um, these are the numbers of slaves taken by different nations and the numbers. Just look at the bottom line here. If you look at the bottom line, one, one million plus taken by Spain or Uruguay. That's, that's the Spanish slave trade. Look at this. Almost six million Africans. That's Portugal and Brazil. Six million Africans. Um, Great Britain, three and a quarter million. The Netherlands, half a million. The United, what becomes the United States, a third of a million. France, 1.3 million. Now, ask yourself, you cannot look at the city of Liverpool without looking at these figures. Liverpool by 1750, 1760, is carrying one African in five across the Atlantic, ships from Liverpool. How can you think of Liverpool history? How can you think of British history without thinking of these figures? Look at France. Anyone goes to Nantes or go to Bordeaux, you see cities that are intimately linked to the Atlantic slave trade. You cannot, look, look, Bordeaux is a beautiful city. Look closely at the warehouses and dock sites and you'll see African heads carved into those 18th century buildings. Go to Nantes along the river. They have a wonderful memorial to the slave. They, they, they've got every single slave ship that left Nantes to take Africans to the French islands in, uh, illuminated in the waterfront. It's a terrific museum, a uh, memorial. Look at the final figure there, you know, 12.5 million. These are e enormous numbers. Now, one of the interesting things about this in terms of Europeans, uh, uh, I'm thinking particularly here of the British, the British have always been able to get off the hook on this because if you're thinking about slavery and why slaves were taken to the Americas from a British point of view, it's, it, it's something that takes place over there. The British look at this as something that's an American phenomenon. The slaves are American. The slaves are Jamaican or they're Brazilian. But of course, the great bulk of them are carried in to North America are in British ships. The British involvement in slavery is absolutely basic to an understanding of British history over a period of three centuries. You cannot think of what made Britain what it became without thinking of, of slavery. And think of, um, I, I don't know how many of you know, you know, the last night of the proms when they, at the Ro Royal Albert Hall, they sing, Rule Britannia. And the line, 18th century song, the, the lines go, Britons never will be slaves. Excuse me, you know, but the, at the very time that song was written, the British are carrying unprecedented number of Africans into slavery in the Americas. There is a kind of 
smokescreen that has traditionally separated the British from their slaving experience. Now, that is changing dramatically. British are coming bit by bit to recognize, as the French are. The French came to this much later than the British, uh, coming to recognize that the slavery and the slave trade and the moving of Africans into the Americas is at the heart of European experience over a period of three, four centuries. And this is what those Africans are primarily moving across the Atlantic to do, to produce sugar. If you look at these figures of consumption of what this, these are British figures for British consumption of, of cane sugar. They're pretty staggering, actually. Um, in the 18th century, the, con the per head consumption of sugar in Britain goes up from four pounds to 13 pounds a head, right? In the 19th century, it goes from 18 pounds to 78 pounds. And for, um, uh, in the 20th century, it goes from 84 pounds to 109 pounds per head of, of sugar. Those of us, older people who were Brits, will remember this. I mean, sugar was absolutely central, not merely to the way uh, we cooked and ate, but it was, it was a, a vital industry. It became something that was quite extraordinary, to the extent that when, Labour, when the Labour government was returned after the Second World War, they determined to nationalise sugar. Now, if you think, if you're a socialist government, you want to nationalize all the great industries around you, transport, health, uh, aviation, railways, whatever it might be, I mean, would you, do, would you think of sugar? Well, you wouldn't, but except that sugar was a really major industry. And it was a major industry because by the mid 20th century, sugar permeated its way into the way we eat, the way we live. Now, this is leaping forward, of course, to the late 20th century. And this is the kind of material that we're all familiar with, of uh, the arguments about fizzy drinks and the impact of sugar on those fizzy drinks, and the way those companies have very cleverly marketed the popular taste for sweetness in cultivating massive sales. But it's not just Coca-Cola. You have to be very careful what you say, by the way, these days. You know, you get corporate lawyers clattering around your ears, uh, even when what you're saying is, is true. Uh, these are uh, various drinks that um, are absolutely filled with sugar, as you can see on the bottom line. Now, here's a very interesting phenomenon. This was a new product which uh, Coca-Cola produced uh, uh, three or four years ago. Now, think of it for a second. Why would you promote a commodity for something it doesn't contain? I mean, think of it. This does not have sugar. It's a zero sugar. Why would you do that? I can't, I honestly can't think of any other uh, commercial venture where you promote something that's something he doesn't have. You know, this does not contain arsenic, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, well, there may be some, but I, I, I don't know of any. Um, it is, a, a, and it's a very interesting direct line to the fact that these major companies are been under the cosh. They've become seriously alarmed about the campaign of the way sugar is damaging health. And the, the, one of the key turning points, to use that kind of often used phrase, the key turning point was that in this was in the last 10 years, the realization or the argument put forward that sugar has become the new tobacco. Time and again, clever strategists have realized that if we can persuade people that sugar is the new tobacco, that really puts these corporations in a serious problem, remembering what has happened to tobacco over the last uh, 30, 40 years. It's not just fizzy drinks, because by the late 19th century, sugar had permeated industrialized foodstuffs. These pictures are of the way, uh, they'd be very familiar to all, everyone around us. Um, these are pictures of women this, this, making biscuits, make, making candies, making cookies in an English factory. Uh, and just, this is in between the second, just after the First World War. This is another one. This actually is from York, my hometown, where I've lived for, for many years. Uh, they're making, uh, I think they're making chocolates, candies, all absolutely laced with heavy amounts of sugar. If you look at the architecture of American and European cities, there are the, some of the biggest factories in the years from 1880s through to, uh, the, down to the mid 20th century, were factories producing foodstuffs and drinks. These are new factories. This is a jam factory uh, in, uh, in London. 
jam made, <laughs> made with sugar, huge amounts of sugar. Um, this is Hartley's jams, now of course apartments, rather like the Domino refinery down the road here. This is uh, a, a, bis a biscuit factory. Look at the size of it. It's, this is making cookies, biscuits, it, in Dublin. It's simply enormous. And sugar is the basic ingredient. This is um, another biscuit. Excuse me, using the English word. It's, it's, there's another biscuit factory. This is Cars in Carlisle, up in the north northwest of England, near the, the Scottish border. Just look at the size of it. This I can actually see. Um, as I walk into town in York, this is Roundtree's chocolate factory, just been sold to be what? To be converted into apartments. Um, but look at the size of it. This was a, started as a small Quaker outfit, then became this massive industry. And wherever you look with the manufacturing of in, uh, industrial foodstuffs and drinks, you see them on an industrial scale. This is, again, for this is Hershey, Pennsylvania. Yeah, look at this, just look at the size of it, you know. Um, these are huge, huge factories, and it gives you some sense of um, uh, the importance of sugar in the production of these um, extraordinary um, drinks and foodstuffs. Again, the Brits will recognize this. Um, this is Mr. Cube. This was uh, invented by the company Tate and Lyle, um, the, sh the great sugar monopoly, really, in, in Britain after the Second World War, to fight off the Labour government's um, determination to nationalise the sugar industry. They invented Mr. Cube. Tate, not state, was the, uh, the motto. And they won. They actually, the Labour, the Labour government couldn't nationalise the sugar uh, industry. And, if, as I say, back to the point I made a little earlier, it is extraordinary that the sugar should, become, should be seen to be so important by an incoming socialist government that it was uh, deemed to be an essential part of the economy to be nationalized. It wouldn't happen now. Cause, um, now, um, this is actually rolling it back to the late 18th century. What, what could be more British than a sweet cup of tea? I make this point time and again. Americans in particular sort of make this, about, make this point about the Brit, don't they? That, you know, we, we love our sweet tea. And it's true, we do. This is uh, the, the king, George III, uh, having his tea. But it's, it's, the, the thing is used by um, uh, the abolitionists. The, uh, it's called the anti-saccharites. It's tr trying to show that the people, uh, they're, they're, they're no longer wanting to use sugar as an example to stop people uh, uh, supporting slavery. Let's stop using sugar and this will undermine slavery. It's, it's an embargo on foodstuffs in a way, as a way of getting at slavery. What could be more British than a sweet cup of tea? Think of it for a second. It's not just the British and their tea. This country becomes a nation of extraordinary coffee drinkers in the course of the 19th century. Coffee is consumed on a scale in North America like nowhere else. But where does that coffee come from? It comes from Brazil. And who cultivates it? Slaves. Slavery is not ended in Brazil until 1888, remember. Americans become massive coffee drinkers on the back of slave labor in Brazil. Look at the city of Manchester. Its coat of arms has a sailing ship on it. This landlocked city with a sailing ship on it. That's very strange. The reason is, of course, that the basic industry in Manchester was cotton. And where did that cotton come from? It was shipped out of Mobile and New Orleans, and it was cultivated by, Africa, by African-American slaves. That you see slavery all over the place. You trip over it, except you don't notice it because it's, it's hidden. From the European point of view, it's hidden five, uh, three, 5,000 miles away. I think until the West has come to terms with the fact that slavery is integrated in the way that the West develops, we'll no, really never come to terms with the, um, uh, the reality of what made North America what it is and what Europe became. In this way, sugar is just a simple commodity. It's mixed with three bitter drinks, tea, chocolate, and coffee, all of them bitter. They're made palatable to the Western taste by the addition of sugar. And that sugar, throughout much of its history, was created by Africans. Look at the extraordinary economic and social phenomenon. 
we have the Western world committed to sweet drinks and sweet foodstuffs, courtesy of Africans shipped 3,000 miles in pestilential conditions across the Atlantic. And those Africans are bought on the coast of Africa, often with commodities which the Europeans had transshipped from India. Huge amounts of Indian textiles are transshipped to West Africa to be exchanged for slaves. You're looking at a global economy. People don't call it um, globalization, but uh, the slavery is at the heart of an extraordinary global economy. And one way into it is to look at the, the story of commodities. What could be more British than a sweet cup of tea? Takes you right to the heart of British history over the last three, four hundred years. Thank you. I'm happy with the questions. There's a man here with a microphone. Mm. Yeah. I just have a qu I will have a lot of questions about that map, but there's a little skinny line that's going from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean back toward England, and I just was curious what that was among my many questions. What is that skinny oh, yes. little yes. line? That's, um, that is a map of people being shipped from Africa, and that is the small numbers that are actually shipped to, to England. There, are, there is a flow of people that, look at any 18th century portraits in, in, in Britain and you see black faces. And that's to represent that. I mean, it, it's not a statistical significant group, but it's to, it's to make it clear that Africans are, are going to England, to Britain, as well as to the Americas. Then a related question is, the, the group that's going from Africa into Arabia, yeah. is there a significant African population or Af African historical population in Saudi Arabia today as a result of this? Well, indirectly, yes, and in India as well. Oh, yes. Uh, people have yet to ask the, the Saudis for reparations, by the way. Um, you know, when people raise the question of reparations, it's, not, it's often... Uh, always at the door of uh, Washington, London, Paris, but not at, uh, at Riyadh. Um, this, uh, what becomes Saudi Arabia absorbs huge numbers of Africans who eventually sort of become part of the broader population, as happens in India. The role of beet sugar in this whole uh, picture of things. Yeah. Sorry, the role of beet sugar. Beet sugar. Yeah. Beet sugar uh, becomes this, uh, yet another alternative to sweetener, doesn't it? And then more recently, of course, chemical sweeteners. Um, um, the truth is that the world demand for sweeteners is, is greater than can be produced by a combination of all these things. There are more people producing cane sugar today than ever before, in addition to huge amounts of uh, sugar beet, in addition to the chemical sweeteners that become familiar. And all of them come with similar problems, similar, similar health problems. Not the same, but what's become apparent is that the sweetness of all forms create extraordinary difficulties about human well-being. Well, no, it was a huge industry in this country, uh, a huge industry in the United States. Uh, but then the Germans, it was actually perfected by the Germans. Uh, it becomes a very big industry in, in, in Europe. And it's, it's a, it was one way that Germans and other non-imperial powers tried to compete with the European countries that had colonies where they grew cane sugar. They could pr produce their own. Napoleon was interested in it. Uh, the Germans pick it up. Uh, great presentation. Uh, you ended by saying um, the... Uh, the exchange of slavery with the with India and commodities coming from India. Can you expound on that a little more? It was a little vague because oftentimes when you speak in respects to when people speak in respects to slavery, they uh, allude to the fact that Africans act actually um, sold sold their own Africans in slavery. And I kind of think, through my personal research, that that's there are some truth to that, but it was a little vague in the way that you ended off. Sure. It was kind of flat to me, so. Okay. Um, and I know you're more of a researcher than I sure. am, so. <laughs> no, no it's, it's a good question, actually. And it's, it comes with all kinds of controversies, obviously. Um, 
the first Europeans that take Africans from West Africa as slaves, they do it in a, pir a piratical fashion. They grab them, put them on the boats and sail away. That's got a limited lifespan because when Africans see a European ship coming, they clear off. They're not going to wait around to be uh, uh, grabbed. What happens, this is a slave trade. Every slave ship that goes to West Africa has huge cargoes on board to exchange for Africans. And who do they do the exchanging with? They do it with local chiefs, with local middlemen, with local merchants. There are, other, there are Africans who specialize in buying and selling Africans. Now, and the question then it rises is, would that have happened had it not been for the demand from the European slave ships? You know, that, but there is a, a thriving African slave trade of, uh, that's prompted by warfare, that's prompted by intertribal disputes, that's prompted by poverty. Famine produces poverty, and people pass on their children because they can't feed them. That's, that's happened not, not merely in Africa, but clean around the world. It's one of the things that lie behind modern slavery. Wretched poverty, people hand over the children or themselves. So that I think it, this is a very sensitive question about how the slave ships acquire their Africans. Without the middlemen, without African women, they couldn't have acquired them. It is a trade. It's a trade. I hope that makes, does that, does that sort of answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, there's an enormous Arab slave trade. I mean, who's taking the Africans? Who are taking the, uh, the, the black Africans across the Sahara? This is a, a very ancient slave route. It lo the Arab slave routes across the Sahara and in East Africa predate the arrival of the Europeans by, on, on their boats in West Africa. You know, the Africans that we know as slaves in the Mediterranean had got there via Arab slave routes. We visited the Whitney Museum in New Orleans, of the Whitney Plantation, no plantation in New Orleans, yeah. mm -hmm. which is set up to tell the story of sugar from the point of view of slaves right. and learn something about the horrendous labor, the horrible conditions, the terrible, mm -hmm. you know, how mm. early children were dying and mm. all the terrible things that happened. But what I really don't know is what kind of labor is involved in producing sugar today? What kind of? Labor. What, what are the conditions oh. for people who are working in producing sugar today? Well, it's interesting. I, uh, if, it depends where you are. If you're looking at the Australian sugar industry, where they've got millions of acres of flat land, it's heavily mechanized. If you're looking at Jamaica, well, in the Caribbean, it's dying out. I mean, some of the small islands don't produce sugar anymore. Barbados, it's effectively gone. Um, but Jamaica, I mean, the people cutting the cane on the fields I showed you those pictures of, they're still, they still have gangs of cane cutters. You could take a photograph of them, and it could be an 18th century picture. And it is one of those god-awful jobs you can think of. In fact, I shouldn't say this, but I tried, I tried it. I, tried, I was young, you know, and there's this little fella from Yorkshire, me, and I joined a, a, a cane cutting gang. Because I thought, if I'm going to write about this, I must try and do it. And I got there early one morning, and my, my friend who owns the plantation said, they, they don't want you. And I knew they didn't want me these big fellas, you know. And not only did they not want, but because they're, they're all smoking ganja. I mean, you cannot get, uh, uh, cane cutters smoke ganja. It makes the job tolerable. It's a bit like alcohol. You know, and the, I lasted 10 minutes. Um, you, know, these, these, and, you know, my hands are kind of like baby's bottom. They're soft. And these fellas are, you know, great beasts of burden. They've been doing it for years. And they'd laughed at me and, you want to smoke, man? You don't know. I gave up. It's, it's a wretched job. And what makes it even worse, of course, is when they burn the cane fields. If they burn the cane fields before to strip off all the foliage, it's like working in a chimney. So the, these guys are completely blackened with soot. It's a very, very unpleasant job. There's some jobs, you know, like being a coal miner, like being a cane cutter, that, that, or being a, 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 a deep sea fisherman. There's some jobs that are, there's no way around it. They're just terrible jobs. Uh, we went to the slave museum 
them in in, um, in England? In Liverpool. In Liverpool. Mm -hmm. and they don't talk about the impact of slavery, and not just the United States, but China, tea from China. They don't talk about why. What you're talking about is really the reason for all of this. Right. Okay. I'm surprised you to say that actually, because uh, like all museums, you know, they they change. Uh, I was actually involved in setting that up actually in 1991-92. At that point, the Liverpool Maritime Museum had one example of Liverpool's involvement with slave trade. They had in a corner of one room, they had a map of the Atlantic and a bag of sugar in the corner. That's all they had. Now they've got a whole museum. Now they've got a whole museum, and. Um, I think they've dealt with it, you know, I've long since moved on from that, but I think they, they, they have fantastic reaction amongst people, particularly young black kids from England. They go and, they, they, you know, they, they, they feel that this is actually something about them. You know, this is telling something about their history. Now, you're never going to get it right. You're going to need to change things because the way we view the past is changing all the time, isn't it? We look at it differently. And... Did you, I hope you told them when you, when you went there, because they have a facility for leaving notes on a wall, aren't they? Um, all of these museums have serious problems with dealing with a subject that has a resonance right down to the present day. This is not, this is not like dealing with the medieval wool trade. This is something that large numbers of people have got very strong personal, emotional feelings about. Uh, and th there's a need to combine and... Uh, historical expertise and kind of social sensitivity, and it's very hard to do it. Working on a good museum exhibit on slavery is a very, very difficult thing. Um, I saw the museum too, and I loved it. I saw it a year ago, and also took the slave tour, slavery tour around Liverpool from, I forgot the guy's name, but anyway, it was great. But my question is about, um, like the way back history of sugar. So mm -hmm. I've read about like the age of honey. So when it yes. was the only sweetness was to collect honey. Mm -hmm. And then my understanding is sugar cane was in India and then Hawaii and yes. then Columbus actually brought a stock with him to right. Hispaniola. Can you, right. can you go to like the way back? I don't totally understand. Yes. I mean, traditionally the Western world had used honey as a sweetener. That was a sweetener. Um, and cane sugar, as you say, it moves westward from its original birthplace, we think, was uh, what is now Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia. And it moves westward, India, and then uh, with migrations and empires, it moves uh, into the Mediterranean. The Crusaders take sugar cane back with them from Palestine, where it was cultivated, back to Western Europe. And it's rare and it's very expensive. Uh, and then it's then cultivated around the edges of the Mediterranean. Um, North Africa, parts of Spain, the Spanish islands, and then it grows out into the island, into the Atlantic islands, into the Canaries. And at that point, the Americas loom. And once, as you say, Columbus takes sugar cane on his first voyage, I think, um, but it's not really its second voyage, second voyage, anyway. Um, but then it comes slightly later. It's, uh, it's developed as a plan. The, the key to it, its key to its success was the, the mix of cane sugar on a plantation and African labor. That, you, know, you can cultivate it with white labor, you can cultivate it with Indian labor, native Indian labor, but it's the importation of Africans in huge numbers that could be replaced cheaply that make it a viable concern. So it's the Africans, again, that the, the key to the, for, the formula. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, I enjoyed your presentation very much. Thank you. But when I was a school kid and we were learning about the triangular, triangular trade, yeah. it was always rum that yes. was um, the what was being imported from the Caribbean. Yes. And I'm curious, is, is that just wrong, or no. did rum compete in terms of the, the sort of size of the trade with cane sugar, or was it... No, no, it's not wrong. I mean, it, rum is, uh, as you know, is a byproduct of the, of the sugar production. I mean, the, these plantations are producing rum as well as uh, sugar. 
there's more rum coming into North America than sugar. Uh, there's huge volumes. Um, rum is a serious problem, a serious drinking problem in colonial North America. And it's really only after independence that whiskey takes over and becomes uh, the drink of choice of North Americans. Um, but rum is actually part of the, but what it is actually, the importation of rum into North America, normally through Rhode Island, that's one of the, the great centers of it, uh, it's in return for timber for the plantations, leather for the plantations, and fish for the slaves. I mean, what is the national dish of Jamaica? Aki and saltfish. Aki is from Ghana originally, saltfish from the Newfoundland fisheries. Now, think of it for a minute. You know, you're looking at an extraordinary international uh, trade, aren't you? Africans imported, being fed on fish from Newfoundland to produce sugar which goes to Europe. I mean, this is an extraordinary kind of... And the triangular trade, the idea actually confuses you, doesn't it? Because it's true in a way, but it's, it's much more complex than that. We ne for instance, there are two big trading systems in the Atlantic. The South Atlantic, which goes... It's, it's all to do with currents and, uh, and uh, wind systems. From the Brazilian slaves arrive going that way clockwise, uh, anti-clockwise. The uh, slaves that arrive in North America and the Caribbean come uh, on the other system. It's quite extraordinary the way it works. Um, and, and we're familiar with the triangular system that looks like as, as if the north, but there are many more Africans that are shipped across in the South, South Atlantic system. I think we have time for one more question. So, sorry. This map speaks to the matter of the trade. This map speaks to the matter of the trade and sugar. But what, where does cotton fit into the picture, particularly to North America? Where does cotton? Oh, cotton. Yes, cotton. Um, well, the, it's another story. It's, of course, the American uh, cotton revolution after, eight, say, after 1800. It doesn't need the Atlantic slave trade because the, the black population of North America is reproducing itself. Unlike the population of Brazil or the Caribbean at this point, the African Americans are reproducing in a way that when planters in Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana want slaves, they don't send to Africa for them. They send to Virginia, to South Carolina, to North Carolina, to Georgia, to the old colonies, and what uh, the United States has is this extraordinary internal slave trade. There's a million and a half Africans, uh, African Americans shifted, rent, wrenched from their families. There is an extraordinary website about people right up to the years of the First World War, old slaves, ex-slaves, freed slaves, looking for their family back where they've been taken from. Uh, it's an extraordinary story. I found a letter only for this new book I just finished of an old lady New Orleans, she writes, the mayor of Baltimore in 1910. Any idea of my, where my people are? Black and white, she says, that's the interesting thing. Of my people, black and white. I was sold in, whenever it was, just before the Civil War, and I'd love to know where my people are before I die. Now, you know, it's kind of heartbreaking stuff. And it's, this is not something that, as I said before, it's not something that's dead and gone. You know, this is right at the heart of many of the issues that we're faced with today. Now, I don't know, I don't, that, that's slightly tangential to what you're saying, but I mean, what you've done is to raise, I think, a really big issue in um, American history. Thank you. Thank you.